On JC Direct this week, ShopRite can buy pick and pay with cash on hand, but should we be buying it? Gold and Bitcoin at all-time highs. Canal Plus finally ups their offer, 125 Rand per share. Hello and welcome to JC Direct, episode 577 for 7 March. My name is Simon Brown. This podcast is brought to you by JustOneLap.com. So let's, before we get into the show, uh, we did our first power hour last week. Uh, everything tax-free, everything uh, ETFs. You'll find it at JustOneLap.com slash power hour. We also announced our new sponsor, Standard Bank. will be kicking off on 18 April. March is just too full of public holidays and all sorts of other crazy bits. But we're back on the 18th of April, third Thursday, monthly. We will still do webcast. We'll still do video. But we're also going to do in person at the Standard Bank head office in Baker Street. And you folks must come around. As I said, there'll be snacks. There'll be drinks. It'll be fun to get to meet everybody. So the big story this week is around the ShopRite results. And I'm not going to dive into them in terms of the, the details of it, but there were a couple of things that really, really stood out. Excellent results. And off a, let's be clear, a high base already. This was six months to ending December. The previous six months had been very good. This also is when they're spending 500 million rand for the period on diesel. But the numbers were all just going in the right direction, and the numbers are staggering. They are spending $8 billion on CapEx. They gave $8.4 billion back to, share, or to, sorry, to, to shoppers, to customers, in terms of savings. And I can speak to that. Mm, a couple of weeks ago, just ahead of Valentine's Day, it was the Monday, I needed to get some flowers for someone. Uh, we went to the local Woolies and Rosebank. Great flowers, but man, expensive. Uh, we went to Spa. Yeah. Poor flowers. We went to pick and pay. They didn't even have flowers. They look at that and it's like, yeah, no, that's too much like hard work. Uh, and so then we went to ShopRite. 100 bucks, really good set of flowers. On the weekend, we did shopping there. The bill came to 1600 but uh, on the slip it says you saved 400 Now, I get what those savings are, you know, but you can get clever with it, right? Some of them are you know, I'll push the price and then put a saving onto it and stuff. But I mean, for example, we got a dishwasher tablets and I, you know, we've got enough now for about six months, but it was a solid price. It was a discount of about a third on those alone. Uh, and my wife knows the price points of these. She's a smart shopper in that regard. Sorry, pick and pay. And that is one of the fun facts. Uh, pick and pay market cap around 9 billion. ShopRite cash and cash equivalents on hand around 9 billion. Now, I appreciate there's some nuances in that, that cash is there, but that's for month end, the next day or two, they start paying suppliers. But it kind of tells you where the story is. And then if we go, and I want to pull up some, uh, the, 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 the prices here, we've got revenue coming through over the last 20 years. And it is frankly a staggering number what we can see here uh shop route in green pick and pay in blue and if we go back 20 years ago pick and pay had more revenue than shop right not by a lot but by a little bit now we fast forward to today and this doesn't include the current uh set of numbers uh pick and pay revenue for the financial year ending june was 215 billion sorry shop right 215 billion pick and pay 109 they have just eaten their lunch and they continue to gain some market share and that's the important thing it's not like they're slowing so then the question comes to everyone to everyone's list which is well is the share cheap and on, you know up what 270 i'm recording this thursday morning just ahead of the market open 270 bucks for pick and pay share is that cheap the PE is currently 22.8. The forward PE is around 20.5 times. Uh, the 10-year mean is 21.1. In other words, it is below that 10-year mean. Now, standard deviation is down at uh, 19, and we have seen it below those levels, most notably, of course, in the pandemic and more recently, uh, sort of late 23, uh, sorry, mid-23. It was down at about 200 bucks. And at the time, I was saying, this is a cheap price for ShopRite. But is this almost the clicks of, of food retailing? And what I mean by that is that is this a situation where ShopRite is always going to be expensive? 
you're seldom going to pick this up on a sub 20 PE. And I've got to say, running at that with a median, 10-year median PE of around 21, uh, and, and I appreciate there's been some pandemics and the like and that, but there's been some lofty value valuations at the same time. Do we find ourselves in a situation where actually 270 is not a bad price? If we go to the, the analysis on it in terms of what, 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 what consensus is for ShopRite and for the pricing of it, it is, as always, I mean, it's never going to be uh, cheap, but what are we looking at? We've got uh, consensus, two buys, two holds, a sell, and a strong sell for the six folks. The average target price is uh, 268.50, shares 270. The high is 312, and the low is 2. 20. So that's what the market, what the consensus forecast is looking for. I got to say, yeah, I mean, shop right above 300. Sure. And that's certainly 10% away. Uh, technically on the chart, uh, it's not you know, necessarily telling us much, but it is at those all times. Weekly chart does suggest that the, what we've seen first three days trading so far in this week, the chart is looking strong. This certainly is 270. Weird. I know. But it might not be that expensive. And it's one of those shares. NVIDIA is another. ShopRite's never NVIDIA. I, I get that point. But NVIDIA, you know, always just, man, this stock's too expensive. Yeah, it's 200 bucks, too expensive. 400 bucks, too expensive. 800, too expensive. And so it goes, and so it goes. I suspect ShopRite's in the same place. So ShopRite could buy, pick, and pay, but it won't. Should we be up by ShopRite? I think maybe we should. Look, I hold it already. Disclaimer, I've held it for 20 years. I picked it up at around 8 bucks, and I actually switched out of pick and pay into ShopRite. The question is, which I've been asked by a lot of folks on the Twitters, why has ShopRite eaten pick and pay's lunch? If you remember back to the 80s, Raymond Ackerman, pick and pay, was the, he was the consumer champion. He, he, he tried to deregulate petrol. He tried to deregulate the bread price. Back in the day, we had a bread board, and bread had to be at a certain price. He fought for the consumer. But now it's ShopRite. Now we get that sense of savings. Folks know that ShopRite has got your, 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 your interests at heart. They know that they go there, they're going to get a really good deal. But what really happened was about those 20 years ago, about when Sean Summers was leaving, ShopRite started doubling down on central distribution distribution centers has made all the difference it gives them efficiency it gives them uh, pricing power it gives them better stockholding levels it absolutely nails it and i did a tiktok video two maybe three weeks ago uh, looking at the potential for pick and pay as an investment i'll come to that in a second the short answer is uh everyone who replied and that video has had two hundred and fifty thousand views everyone was just hating on pick and pay as a consumer shopping experience and that's the problem that they have and then pick and pay came out with that horror update i'd liked it i'd thought there might be a four billion rights issue coming through at most i thought probably around two instead they're doing four billion rights issue they're selling parts of boxer which is their winning brand they're in breach of debt covenants their debt is more than doubled to seven billion yeah how do you go bankrupt slowly and then suddenly could pick and pay go bust it could. I mean, it, it's at that point where it absolutely could. Now, that doesn't mean it would disappear. It would go into business rescue and the like, and it probably won't happen. But I've got to say, I have bailed on those pick-and-pay shares. Took a small loss. It was a speculative position. It was a small position. And as I spoke on the, the TikToks of a few weeks ago, I really thought that there was some potential here, but it turns out it is so much worse. And ShopRite with those distribution centers, with those efficiencies, as I say, is just eating their lunch. So ShopRite could buy pick and pay, won't, good idea, don't, uh, but uh, should we buy ShopRite? I gotta say, 270. Yeah, and this is bottom draw type stuff. 270, I think it looks cheap. Your risk is, does one day ShopRite stumble? And, and, and that's absolutely, I mean, the answer is maybe they do. But you, you know what it is when you've got sort of like a, 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 a race between products, horses, whatever it is, right? One's in front and the other's struggling to catch up. And then the one in front stumbles, slows down, doesn't implement strategy well, doesn't do central distribution, whatever the case may be, the other one overtakes. To catch up, it's not just that pick and pay has to run faster, which they haven't done in 20 years. They also then need ShopRite to slow down 
And ShopRite hasn't done that in 20 years either. I'm a big fan of finding great sectors, and food retail is a great sector, and then finding the winners in that space. Because winners tend to know how to win. It's in their DNA. They don't suddenly roll over and stop winning. So we've got gold and Bitcoin at uh, all-time highs, which is weird, right? Because normally you would think to yourself, well, gold would be at a all-time high because of fears, right? What are we scared of? There's a ton to be. You know, the markets are worried about inflation. It hasn't really been beaten. Interest rates, when do they start coming down? Uh, Jerome Powell last night uh, in his testimony to Congress said, you know, rate cuts are not intimate. Now, that's probably just talk. And you know what? Is mid-year not intimate? What he's certainly saying is March, no chance. That 30 April, 1 May meeting, no chance. Okay, fair enough. But is it mid-year? But what happens if it's not quite? And, and that's one of the fears that gold has. What about recessions? So the U.S. is avoiding a recession, but recessions are, you know, carving through Europe and Asia and everywhere else. Locally, we avoided a technical recession by 0.1%. That was our GDP for fourth quarter of last year. Third quarter had been minus 0.6. Two negative quarters, we would have been in recession. So we avoided it, but only just. So there's all of those fears. We've got conflicts, Middle East and Europe. I mean, proper wars happening. We've got the Red Sea. At the moment, that's just a container ship issue. They're staying away from the oil supplies. But if that changes... Drought in Panama Canal, thrown to that Taiwan, thrown to that the Straits up to Iran. Those four sea voyages are half of global uh, shipping. That's where half of the, sh the stuff goes. Uh, and suddenly they could all get clogged to varying different degrees. I'm not saying it's happening. I'm not even saying it's very likely to happen. But at this point in time, those are the fears. Elections the world over. We've got 70 plus elections, 56% of global GDP. So there's a lot for markets to be scared for and, and, and scared they absolutely are. So gold trading at uh, all time closing highs hasn't yet tagged and it's even maybe taken the intraday high out. So gold is looking very, very bullish at this point, nicely above $2,100, uh, trading 2150 as I'm recording this. What's the target here? You'll hear folks out there saying 5000 10000 That's nonsense. I, I, mean, not, I mean, maybe in time, but that's not what we're targeting. If we look at the range it was trading from around 1600 uh, to around 2000 2050 there's about, that is the range that goes back to sort of pandemic forward. That takes us to a target of around $2,500. That's 20% uplift for gold. And that will boost the gold miner profits, I mean, more than 20%, right? Because their costs don't increase in a perfect world. I mean, there's inflationary costs. But that leverage effect, costs don't increase. That extra 20% in price just drops to the bottom line. It just goes straight to the bottom line. And it makes a profit become 50, 60, 100% up instead. And I had a look at the gold miners. And this, over the last uh, three years, what we've got is GLD, which is gold in uh, uh, Czar. It's up 55%. Nice. Uh, Goldfields in Harmony, respectively, 118 and 111%. Uh, Pan-African, 45. Anglo Gold Ashanti, 35. And DRD, under 9%. In other words, there are some clear laggers here. Now, do you go with the gold fields and the harmonies because they've somehow managed to massively outperform gold? Do you go with the pan anglos or the, uh, the, the DRDs? I've gone with Anglo Gold Ashanti. It's nice. It's in profit at this point. I also hold the GLD locally, although the, the ETF GLD, which comes from One Invest, is actually slightly cheaper on a total expense ratio. We've got the details of all of those. If you go to justonelap.com slash ETFs, we've got all of the gold ETFs there. You can go and find those uh, and have a look-see. There's two local, and then, of course, there's also the offshore one in New York, which is also GLD, but that is gold in dollars. I'm holding gold. I'm holding Anglo Gold Ashanti. I'm liking the gold story. Uh, I'm comfortable with the gold story. The weird thing, as I point out, is that... What we've got here is essentially gold saying the world is going to end and then Bitcoin coming along and saying, nah, 
everything's rosy. Bitcoin is a risk on asset. So gold is for when you're scared and Bitcoin is for when everything's going to be okay. And they're both at all-time highs. So Bitcoin got that new high above 69,000 on Tuesday evening, promptly collapsed to 59,000 and is now back at about 66,000. What's the long-term target on, go on Bitcoin? I have no idea. I, I have no idea whatsoever. Uh, certainly, once it's, you know, it's got to get back through that high again. I mean, you know, 70, of course, 80, 100. I don't know what the target is. Uh, we've got a halving happening in April. That means that the miners earn half the amount of revenue that they used to. But the big thing here, the big story for, for what's been helping uh, Bitcoin, aside from the halving, which is not insignificant, the really, really big deal has been, quite simply, that we got those 11 ETFs back in January. And what those 11 ETFs have done is, well, they've all been going in and frantically buying Bitcoin. So uh, the point is, why would you buy the ETF? To what benefit is there to buy the ETF? Well, short answer, not a heck of a lot because you can go and buy it via an exchange. But a lot of folks won't go to some third-party exchange. We've seen issues with exchanges. We've seen problems with withdrawals. We've seen exchanges go bust, get hacked, lose 24% of their coins, and so the list goes on. So these ETFs are, firstly, for those who have the mandate. For example, I very seldom, uh, truthfully, apart from Bitcoin, I don't go off JSC. I buy my stuff on the JSC or New York or something, but registered exchanges, recognized exchanges. Now suddenly folks are saying, well, hang on a second, I can get this in my normal brokerage account. And some of the institutional investors who simply can't go off exchange suddenly can. So we've seen massive inflows into these ETFs, and that undoubtedly has helped boost the price. Make no mistake about that. That has helped the price heading higher. But what we've got now is Bitcoin at highs. We've got gold at highs. They are contrary for reasons. I hold both because, you know what, I like things making new highs. I like things that are going up in price. I mean, that, that's where there is uh, money to be made, as you would say. Uh, and then the last story for the week is uh, Canel Plus, or Plus, as you're supposed to say, have finally come back with their updated offer. It is 125 Rand for uh, multi-choice. The stock's trading 113.50. That makes sense, right, what you've got here in essence, is that time value and risk value of the deal happening. I was saying on earlier in the week, I thought 125 was about the right price. I think this is it. It's not going to come better. Multi-choice will come back and tell you if they agree, they get an independent board to look into it. I think the independent board will say, take the money and run. So I think it's over. There is still the issue, which hasn't been resolved, around the fact that they can't have more than 20% voting rights. Okay, but I've spoken in previous podcasts about how that is manageable. Uh, don't overly stress that. And then a quick last one, which I've been seeing left, right, and center, but it came through in the sea harvest results. I'm always fascinated by the fishing stocks. I always think there should be a great investment opportunity here, and there never is. I, I, and and I've, I've, I've never actually got around to buying one of them. I've had them on watch lists over the decades, and it's just gone nowhere. But... Sea Harvest net finance costs up 79% to 223 million, driven by higher interest rates. We've been seeing a lot of this coming through. We had Cura results, same sort of story. Companies with debt, most of them have debt. Now that we're sort of, you know, well into the rate hiking cycle, okay, we've paused, but we're up those elevated levels, debt is becoming expensive. And we're starting to see it in the results. So, Corporate South Africa has ESCOM challenges, which if your shop right is a 500 million rand per six-month bill, a billion rand a year. They've got logistic challenges, uh, which if you are Mr. Price means you can't get stuff through the ports. If you're Fungela, you can't get your coal to, uh, to, to Richards Bay Coal Terminal and so on. And now they've got interest rates hurting as well. This is squeezing. This is squeezing. Now, the interest rates will start to fade away. The port issues... Or better. I go to Vessel Fund and I've been counting the ships outside of Harbour in Durban and Cape Town. Both of them markedly improved since uh, the December crisis. We've got a new CEO at uh, Transnet. And we've also got the, the deal with uh, uh, Terminal 2 in Durban Harbour has, been, has done the due diligence and passed. So we're going to get that uh, private uh, joint venture, public-private JV happening there. 
interest rates should start coming down. I was going to say ESCOM's getting better. We've just gone into stage four. But there's glimmers in the future. But it has been tough. And that is just the stark reality. It has been no fun whatsoever for corporate South Africa at that point. So we'll leave it there for today. Go have a look at our Power Hour video. I'm chuffed with it. I thought it was a great video. We've had great responses from it. Just one lap.com slash power hour. You will find it. Next Power Hour will be 18 April. We're then as speakers and yet we'll get that in the next few weeks. But otherwise, we'll leave it there. My name is Simon. As always, look after yourself. And if you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers all. <laughs>